Hello, a very good evening. Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Swarajya Conversations. Today we have the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, V. Anantha Nageshwaran. Good afternoon, sir. Very happy to have you. Good afternoon. Thank you. A wonderful economic survey, sir, this year. Lots of numbers, lots of insights into what the government has been doing for the past eight years, especially in the past three years that have been marked by the pandemic and then the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So a wonderful economic survey. Congratulations for that. Thank you very much. Of course, naturally, I am receiving this appreciation from you on behalf of my entire team, which put in lots and lots of hard work and commitment. And uh, they were perhaps as motivated as I was or even more to make sure that what we did was the best that we could. So if I look at the budget and the economic survey together, the economic survey, especially more than a philosophical document like it used to be in the past, this year it was more about lining up a roadmap for the future. So now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we hopefully are completely out of it. The inflation is easing out, which was induced by the crisis last year. Where do you see the priority for the government in the next two, three, four years when it comes to getting the economy back on track? Look, I mean, honestly, the government has done a lot of heavy lifting in the last several years, both before and during the pandemic, not just in terms of responding to the pandemic, but also putting in place the building blocks on which others could build their super infrastructure in the private sector. So what the government needs to do is exactly what the budget has done, not rocking the boat, but keeping uh, on a steady course uh, without committing too many, uh, you know, um, undertaking too many risks and risking the macroeconomic stability. So the government job is to maintain macroeconomic stability, ease bottlenecks for households, for businesses, tighten, uh, you know, leakages and make the system more efficient in tax administration and using the enhanced resources, not only to support the vulnerable sections, but also to contribute to future growth and in the, and also achieve um, fiscal consolidation as per the glide path, because that is what would bring down the cost of capital for other segments of the population, whether it is businesses or households, etc. And that in itself would become a much bigger stimulus. So government has done a lot of heavy lifting. And from now on, it has to just continue to chip away at the uh, temporary and uh, superficial blockages and inefficiencies that are there. And it is now time for the private sector to step up to the plate and deliver on in terms of capital investment, employment generation, etc. So one of the chapters that really caught my attention in the survey was the one on infrastructure. And we've been talking about the National Infrastructure Pipeline. We've been talking about it for a long, long time now. But the good thing was projects close to 60 lakh crore rupees are already under implementation. Now, where do you see the importance of this big infrastructure push? Because the headlines were also about the capital expenditure, the increase since the financial year of 2016, which is now almost four times. Where do you see the importance of infrastructure? And a follow-up question also. What do you do about the delays that have been plaguing a lot of infrastructure projects in the past? How do we fix them going forward? Look, I mean, the delays occur through multiple channels because this is a democratic country. There are lots of stakeholders who are affected by uh, an infrastructure project and they try to do their best to protect their interest and it has to go through the legal process. So some of these things are uh, beyond the government's control. But wherever there are things that are within the government's control, and that is where project uh, PM Gati Shakti comes into play in terms of better planning, in terms of better sequencing. And that will take care of time and cost overruns, minimize them. And hopefully this results will show. Obviously, this is not a, a problem where results can be expected and achieved overnight. It will, it should over time show up in a lower and lower cost overruns and uh, timely execution of projects. Now, where do we see the uh, coming to the first part of your question? Where do we see infrastructure coming into play? Obviously, um, uh, in the first decade of the millennium, Indian economic growth was very much facilitated by a global economic boom. But now the global economy is in booming and it is struggling. And therefore, we need to rely on on domestic growth and we need to rely on domestic growth but we should not have a situation where after three to five years of growth there is overheating hmm. excess imports higher inflation higher current account deficit and currency depreciation etc so we don't want to have uh, uh, 
short economic cycles. We want to have long economic cycles, which are sustainable. And that can happen only if potential growth is enhanced. And infrastructure investments, both physical and digital, do exactly that. They are meant to enhance the productive potential so that, so, so that the non-inflationary growth of the economy keeps moving higher. And even when we achieve those growth rates in reality, we are able to sustain them over longer period and that is the significance of the infrastructure investment wonderful so you mentioned inflation and i cannot stress this enough while the world last year was struggling with the food and energy crisis given what was happening in ukraine india relatively fared a lot well but even then the reserve bank of india was taking cue from what the fed was doing with respect to the rate hikes and the credit expansion obviously was dented with the higher rate of interest now, how would you describe India's inflation situation compared to last year? How do you see it going forward? And will they, this year be, you know, the year when the interest rates finally start coming down, at least stabilize? Look, I mean, uh, India's inflation performance was much better than developed countries because of the fact that we did not overstimulate the economy during the pandemic years. Hmm. And at the same time, there was an incipient inflation pressure and the peak inflation rate did touch 7.8% in India, consumer prices combined in April uh, 2022. Hmm. And therefore, the Reserve Bank of India had to respond and they responded. Once they responded, once they pivoted, they responded quite forcefully and, and continuously over the remainder of the year. Uh, leaving uh, nobody in doubt as to what their intent is. And that prevented the second round effects of the commodity prices spilling over into the rest of the economy. And of course, in the second half of the year, that global commodity prices also declined health quite a bit. Now, whether we will be in a position to cut interest rates or not naturally depends on how inflation evolves this year. And both private sector and RBI estimates are that the inflation rate would come keep declining and come towards 4 to 5% range in the course of 23-24. And uh, I think rate interest rate reductions uh, are not something that we can predict at this point. But, and I leave it to the RBI to do that prediction. It's not my job. Uh, but that said, India's real policy rates, that is nominal rates adjusted for inflation are not particularly high. And sometimes we should not think of interest rates as barriers to investment, but as reflecting the underlying demand for credit. But there's also some worry among some skeptics and observers that too much of interest rate hikes are also triggering a slowdown. And they have been revised estimates with respect to growth. Do you see that as a worrying sign that probably the interest rate hike for India at least might not be in the best interest, say what is happening in the West comparatively? I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, um, world over, whether it is advanced or emerging economy, in capital investment plans are dictated to by underlying demand visibility for investors. Hmm. And interest rates, even if there is no central bank, assuming there is no central bank, but interest rates will have to reflect the higher demand for credit in a growing economy. And in a growing economy, which has a continuous investment needs, if there is demand for credit, which is more than what deposits are coming through, mm. it would rise whether or not there's a central bank. So just to sort of find a scapegoat uh, for, for inability to invest for various other reasons is not the most persuasive argument one can make. Right. Now, the next question is, which which has become the fusion of both politics, economics, and even policy for that matter, is manufacturing. Now, in a country like ours, we would look forward to manufacturing, but now it's become a political question with respect to the PLIs, what's what happening in the 14 sectors. How do you see the progress of the PLI so far? The first question is, where do you how do you see the progress so far? And point number two, we've been talking about semiconductors. We've seen what happened with the supply chain crisis world over. Where do you see the future of PLI, say, 5, 10, 15 years down the line? How do we get more manufacturers to come and build in India? I did uh, make, uh, I just spent quite some time in my presentation on the economic survey on the PLI. Look, I mean, it is a project uh, where we are taking a leaf out of the books of East Asian economies that went from third world to first world in a single generation. And that involved active industrial policy. And today the developed world is once again embracing 
industrial policy. In fact, as a very perceptive commentator wrote in the mid industrial policy actually it is not back in fashion because it never went out of fashion everywhere in the world including in the developed world and the important thing was was india is concerned uh, in the current pli program much of the sectors were expanded the list was expanded only in 2021 and then in 22 uh, international uh, firms and indian firms were expected to respond with their proposals for investment but then in 2022 we also had the uh, commodity price shock and followed by the interest rate shock in the developed world. So I think that is going to be uh, some time taken by companies to put in their proposals and for them to be sifted through and approvals granted, production to commence, etc. So we should not be looking at um, the instantaneous results from this scheme. And secondly, I would also mention that PLI scheme is following a portfolio approach you are trying this in 14 sectors some of them may succeed spectacularly some average some may not but that's par for the course and and then it is not as if it is going to cost the government anything if there is if there are failures in some sectors because payment is only against performance payment is not in anticipation of performance so where does the question of the fiscal costs arise on a lighter note, what do you say to all those commentators, and I, I'm guessing you would know who I'm referring to, who say that perhaps the focus should be on services and capacity building and not manufacturing. What do you make of those commentators? I, I, I don't agree with that uh, because uh, some of these commentators have also said in the past that India should raise the manufacturing share of GDP as well. And I see no reason why India should not try to do that because India's manufacturing share of GDP has been historically on the lower side because we didn't have the kind of infrastructure that was required to help manufacturing at scale and to be able to export them. But now we have this concerted push on, on, on infrastructure investment, whether it is in highways or airports or the port coverage, uh, etc. There is a very distinct improvement in physical infrastructure. Now it is being complemented by the digital infrastructure. And therefore, there is every chance that India now uh, can plug itself into the global supply chain in specific areas and the moment is there for India to grab. It doesn't necessarily have to come at the cost of um, uh, attention to services sector, which we are doing, whether it is uh, tourism or artificial intelligence. Mm. Uh, India in this, uh, in this uh, budget also has emphasized some of these sectors and services exports are an important source of stability for our external balances and therefore uh, uh, we we should be uh, riding both the horses and not just abandon one for the other. There was also a very interesting chapter on agriculture and the finance minister also made some key announcements pertaining to the sector. Now, what we've seen in 22 with respect to not just Ukraine, but also we were seeing the kind of inflation in Japan, for instance. Countries have realized that food security is paramount. The globalized world may not always cater to the food security interest. Keeping that into context, where do you see the future of agriculture in India? Because at some point, we have to factor in climate change. We have to factor in the growing population. We have to factor in lowering of imports, so of oil seeds and cereals and pulses and things like that. So where do you see the future of agriculture and where do you see the involvement of technology and how do we get there? Look, I mean, I see agriculture as playing an important role in our country for quite some time to come. I mean, there is no, there is no question of looking beyond agriculture at this stage because there is substantial percent of the population that that depends on agriculture even now even though the proportion might have come down and secondly agriculture is no longer about uh, food security which, which we have achieved but it is also about nutritional security yes. and there india has a lot to offer to indians and even to the outside world and that is what the year of the millets which the honorable finance minister referred to as sri anna in her uh, budget speech yesterday so there is much room for India to show how, in spite of climate change, there are enough hardy crops in the uh, uh, tropical environment which we can rely on, which are also not necessarily water guzzling and therefore environmentally friendly, and which can meet the nutritional needs of population in these parts of the world. And these are suited for the kind of uh, climatic patterns that uh, this region has. And we have therefore a lot to offer on that score as well. And agriculture can be resilient to these climate changes if we only we choose the right kind of crop mix. And uh, technology is already playing a part in terms of you know the soil uh, health analysis, in terms of the shift 
to different uh, patterns of fertilizer usage. Uh, and, and I think we need to be we need to be open to the role that technology can play not only in helping farmers with their um, uh, with their crop patterns related to climatic changes, but also with respect to even risk management, uh, crop failure management, even financial technology. All these things will be there to help the farmers uh, even out their fluctuations so that they don't remain too much uh, captive to short term forces. The final question, one of the interesting chapters was on the social infrastructure, social right. digital infrastructure, and you mentioned about the direct benefit transfer. And this is something we've seen evolve over the last eight years. People have got their bank accounts, their toilets, their cylinders, you name it, and they've got it. Come 2024, and you've given people in rural India, almost 800 million people, the basic necessities. How do you see them enabling to create jobs from there on? Now, we've given them the social infrastructure. How do we make them a part of our economic infrastructure as well? Well, that is what is happening through the public uh, digital infrastructure spread and outreach because these, this development is helping to formalize many portions of the economy that were outside the formal sector. Now they see the benefits of joining the formal sector, the digital footprints that they create even for small denomination payments is bringing them into the formal economy fold and that increases their opportunities both with respect to markets and with respect to finances. And you take the example of, uh, let's take GST for example. 80% of the GST taxpayers were payers of GST in the old era as well. So they migrated to the new system post 2017. <clears throat> but around 20% of the new GST taxpayers are new. And the average tax that they pay is around 1.1 lakh rupees per annum, whereas the average tax that the, that the migrated taxpayers pay is around 4.2 lakhs. Hmm. So you can see that the bulk of the new entrants into the GST tax network are all small and micro enterprises, and they are getting formalized. And this is how the social sector in, uh, 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 schemes of the government, in combination with technology, are providing people the opportunity to mainstream and earn their livelihoods. And while they are doing so, the government is holding so that the quality of life does not suffer. Thank you for those very uh, wonderful insights, sir. And thank you for your time. We wish you well from Swarajya. Thank you very much. I'm happy to have had this conversation with you, Tushar. Wish, all, wish you all the best in Swarajya too. Thank you. Thank you.